So what is the impact exactly? And we could, if we had time, we could just have a roaming mic and learn about the impact firsthand. But I want to just give an overview of what I see clinically and what the research tells us that I hope can resonate with your lived experiences in this room. First, I want to just give some brief summaries of the types of things we're talking about. And when I share these summaries, I want you to really look for commonalities, but also look for different layers of trauma. They, they really exhibit different types of trauma coming from different sources. So these, all these names have been changed, but all of these situations are with women that I'm working with currently or in the last year. Maxine, who's 51, used her husband's laptop computer when the family computer crashed and found countless links to porn sites and sexual conversations with other women. He flatly denies it when confronted and suggests that she is crazy. Rachel, who's 39, during a routine physical exam at her doctor's office, learned she has contracted an STD. In this case, it was chlamydia. Um, today, she's infertile because of that, because it was not caught. She was in a monogamous relationship. She had no reason to believe, and chlamydia of, of many of them has the fewest symptoms that's detectable right away. Her husband, it came out later, has engaged in high-risk sexual behaviors with female and transgendered prostitutes for 13 years. And it later in the disclosure process, we learned that over $85,000 had been spent on addiction behavior. So now we not only have medical trauma, emotional trauma, financial betrayal as well, right? Look for the different layers. Lori, who's 23, learns her husband, new husband, has a serious pornography addiction while on their honeymoon. When pressed, he admits to lying about it before they married hoping that marriage would solve the problem. Does marriage solve the problem? No. Many times it will exacerbate it. So if we have any single people here or parents of young adults, please, we need to break through this myth that marriage solves this. It doesn't. She feels betrayed by him as well as all of her in-laws and clergy who knew about the chronic addiction yet openly encouraged the marriage because they had fallen into that myth and fraudulent idea that marriage will fix this because this is about sex. And if he's in a sexual relationship, this will all be well. Well, we know that that's just not the case. So there's a breakdown in understanding on many levels with that. Lastly, Jocelyn, who's 45, well-respected husband and father of four, is arrested for possession and distribution of child pornography. Their quality of life and social standing as an entire family abruptly changes. She is told by a religious leader three weeks out of this occurring, she must forgive or the greater sin will lie with her. Okay, again, look, now we have secondary trauma from religious leaders who are pressuring to forgive with little understanding of really what this means and how long it takes to even understand the truth, never mind heal from it. An important point, and I realize these are small to see at the end, but the visual, even if you can't read them, the visual point I want to make with this slide is that there's a wide range of types of acting out. And it's been my experience that women that come forward, there's almost always several, at least two or three different types of acting out in the mix. So this was by a study that looked at almost 9,000 partners of sex addicts. And this was just released last year, 2016. For any of you that are interested in social science data, this is an extremely impressive number for a sample, almost 9,000 people. And what they found was 79% of, of those surveyed had faced internet pornography as one of the forms. It is the most common form of acting out today. But you see this gradual slope that from internet pornography all the way to bestiality, which is represented by 1.5%, there is a wide range of behaviors that we can be impacted by and that go into the combination of addictive behaviors. In my small practice in Louisville, Colorado, and I keep my practice small for a number of reasons, but every single type of acting out, including bestiality, I have worked with in the last three years. 
So none of these are to be minimized. All can be painful, and I think sometimes there's a, out of discomfort, none of these are comfortable to talk about. But we sometimes, well, uh, that's so rare, that doesn't happen. It does happen. Also, the consequences of addiction, not just the acting out. We look at roughly 65% of those when these issues come up experience family conflict. That's a lot. Almost 40% experience public shame of some sort, health consequences, financial loss, loss of relationships, children hurt emotionally, and job loss, almost 10%. Again, these are significant, and I want it to create a fuller, richer picture of what it is that people are, are faced with, and very often have lived for years not knowing that this was bubbling underneath a life that they thought they had. An important piece that often gets missed is looking at the associated behaviors that go along with an addiction. Very often it's not the addictive behavior itself that's the hardest to cope and deal with. It's these associated behaviors. By a show of hands, how many of you have heard someone, or maybe yourself, but I'm not going to call anyone out on this, how many of you are aware of this idea that the lying is sometimes the most painful, hardest thing to face? Show of hands, who would agree the lying and the deception is just the really big hurdle? And that's important for anyone in the room that may be thinking, there's no way I can come clean with this. Coming clean is the way out. And that honesty is so often what is wanted as a baseline recovery move for someone dealing with betrayal. Denial, blame shifting, narcissism, Anger, deficient parenting. We know from studies that people that are engaged in pornography regularly have, it's impossible to spend that much time and be so dissociated and sucked into a behavior. It's impossible to be present and fully on board as a parent. Sexual coercion and avoidance. Controlling behavior, financial betrayal, domestic violence, which we don't give its own attention to often enough substance abuse in 40 to 60 percent of the cases, and gaslighting. What I mean by gaslighting, it's a legitimate psychological term. If you look that up in the American Psychological Association website and type in gaslighting, you will find that for several decades that's been a term used to describe, well, I'll read it in a second, it came, it, the term was based out of the 1944 Ingrid Bergman film called Gaslight. If someone's in active trauma, I don't recommend watching it, but it's a good reference point because it's a story of how a wealthy socialite married uh, a husband and he was out to get her money and estate and slowly over time convinced her that she was losing her mind and becoming blind. And he did that by slowly turning down the gaslight. This is an old black and white film. And convincing her that her senses and her mind were, there was something wrong with her, when in fact there wasn't anything wrong with her. So gaslighting we know is a manipulation through persistent denial, misdirection, contradiction and lying, and why would someone do that? In an attempt to destabilize and delegit delegitimize someone. And people do this to try to get someone off their tail, off their tracks, they're hiding something. Most people, we know from studies, that most people that are gaslighting, it's not with malicious intent. There's typically a mountain of shame that they're just trying to keep you at arm's length away from so that you don't catch on to the truth of their lived reality. <coughs> at its core, gaslighting is a reality distortion and can be a form of emotional abuse in its extreme. As with many relational dynamics, it's on a continuum. So you'll see very mild, to very extreme. And I would, I would say every single one of us in this room have gaslit at one point or another. So for example, as a parent, I recognize moments where I gaslight my kids. Kate will come to the kitchen and ask me, what are we having for dinner? And I'll mention a meal, salad, let's say. Oh, mom, I hate salad. Why, why do we have to have salad? <laughs> why can't we have this or that? And I'll say, Kate, you love salad. What are you talking about? You know, joking with her. You love salad. Do you remember that time you just were asking for salad? And, 
And that's a form of gaslighting, right? It's tongue in cheek and it's lighthearted. But if I did that every single day, if every time she brought up, Mom, I don't like that, or I don't want to go to church, I hate going to church, you love church. If, if we're constantly met with distorting what we're speaking our truth around, that's gaslighting. Okay, so it's on a continuum. So the common effects experienced by married women, and all of these are research-based. If anyone ever wants resort the citations for any of this, please let me know. The APSATS website, I'm the research chair for APSATS, and we've compiled now 20 research summaries from the top studies on partners over the last 10 years. So I'll direct you to that for lots of good information. Intense emotions and difficulty regulating those emotions. Disruption in core beliefs, including religious beliefs and trust. Changes in her perception of reality and in herself, her self-concept. Hypervigilance is a common uh, hallmark of trauma. Policing behaviors. I've often joked with clients when they're in a good space that the FBI really should contact me. I have lots of great future agents for them, the links that people will go to to, in stealth ways, find out the truth. And, oh, and changes in weight, body image, sleep, appetite, and libido are all common impacts of this. We also see increased risk of separation and divorce. We've known that for some time. The vast majority of women experience isolation. Even the social butterflies in a room who may have really positive family ties will also experience isolation shielding themselves maybe from rushes to judgment about the relationship, oh, you need to leave, or you must stay, or um, just not wanting their husband to have a black X on his forehead forevermore in the family should he be in recovery, right? There's a lot, it gets really complicated as to who she can reach out to and where she can find safe places to just talk this through. She often blames herself or is blamed, especially if there's been a history of gaslighting. Fears for her children, risks for STDs, abrupt changes in her own behavior. In the last six months, I've admitted two LDS women who've never had a history of drinking to inpatient facilities for alcoholism because they turn to alcohol for coping with betrayal trauma. So these behaviors can get maladaptive really quickly. So we have to keep close close monitoring on them. Post-traumatic stress disorder, which I've always has, have already said is the case for the majority of people coming in. It's not for everybody, so that's why it's so important that we do testing. I run a PTSD test that's specific to partners for every single person that comes to my office. And it's really helpful to get an accurate gauge of where do they fall on that scale. Because one thing that I really want to share, especially with any clinicians in the room, it's not enough to know about betrayal trauma, and it's not enough to offer validation and empathy for that. It needs to inform and affect the timing and way that we work with this issue. So if someone is working with me and they're highly elevated in PTSD symptoms, that may be someone that we really try to slow down a disclosure process for and really include them in that process so they feel empowered and a part of it. And while they're gaining grounding skills and trauma treatment to be prepared for that type of intervention. The point being, all of this information needs to affect and change the hows and the whys of what we do. Um, some interesting numbers. 96% of women report that learning of the sexual addiction was very traumatic in their lives. 48% um, have moderate to severe PTSD. So this, this is a significant issue. Betrayal trauma, for those of you that may be newer to that idea, I think in Utah there's more momentum and focus on this. In Colorado, I am a lone voice. <laughs> I can just, I, I swim upstream constantly trying to teach colleagues and physicians about this topic. So you really are fortunate being here that you have groups like SA Lifeline that get it, what a blessing that is. The betrayal trauma for someone that is newer to that idea is anytime someone that we depend on for survival, for example, a child to a parent, or with a spouse that we have a strong attachment to, we share life with, 
when someone in that type of a role in our life betrays our trust and violates that trust in a critical way, we call that betrayal trauma. Secondary trauma can occur, it is real. If we reach out, for example, for help in a vulnerable place, let's say we go to a religious leader for help and the religious leader is less than nurturing, because, not intentionally, but out of ignorance or just not having training on this issue, for instance, secondary trauma is a real thing. Depression, anxiety, and suicidality. Domestic violence and abuse, emotional abuse. I wish that we talked more about unrighteous dominion in this. I believe pornography use in and of itself, just the viewing and using another's body for selfish gain is a form of unrighteous dominion. And I, I would invite you to think about that and to maybe include that terminology when we're talking frankly about this issue. My colleague and friend, Dr. Barbara Steffens, who's the president of APSATS, and she wrote the book, Your Sexually Addicted Spouse, which was one of the first books to introduce betrayal trauma and how different that is from a codependency model. She said a statement that I just really love. She said, she's not just mad at him, referring to a spouse. Her whole world has been shattered. And just imagine how scary it would be if your windshield looked like this, if this was your car, and this rock just blew through your window and someone saying, well, you can't fix the window right now. You have to keep picking up the kids from school and driving I-15 to get to work and your windshield's like that. It would it'd be terrifying. You wouldn't be able to see anything clearly. You'd have so much wind coming at you in this gaping hole and nothing would see, everything would be distorted. 